So now, uh, for our next block, I have the image of the image of the time. And uh, also, the image of doing something I've already done before. Now, I have a bigger, bigger conference. Um, and the last European first year of the conference, the big one in the name that now comes about, um, we were basically in the same situation as we have. now. It's definitely going to look. Uh, as invisible. Um, the bank tell you something about it, except for being a fellow of the He is also an accountant professor at the University of Chicago. He is managing director of the European Doctor Institute. Uh, he's a huge fan of high and German organism. And he uh, a menace for all anarchists uh, everywhere, including libertarian anarchists. Um, today he will talk to us about inevitability politics, which I kind of see as a continuation of a, of a long history of the energy. So I take this very personally. Um, so please come to welcome my friend Professor Stephen Kelly. Thank you. So you could be here. No, then, then. Um, well, let's thank you for this um, visual introduction. It's great to be here for many reasons. Um, first of all, when I left the area of Germany 15 years ago, most of my friends, uh, like myself, were just anti communists. Um, so we knew what we hate, and we knew what we opposed, but we had some difficulties in conceptualizing what they were pro or for. And it's really fascinating to be here today and to see so many young people uh, having read interesting stuff and not just having read against communism, but um, really people with various interests in liberty. And I say various interests because I think liberalism is not just one type of liberalism, pure liberalism or uh, radical liberalism, uh, but there are many. <laughs> and, um, this is the second reason I'm glad like to be here with you today because it's sort of a strange uh, consequence of events. And just a bit ago, I was in Berlin and I went to Tokyo and we ran across to a wonderful American um, economist and philosopher who presented her present stuff to a lot of leftist uh, auditorium of historians. And there, the moderator told me in the end that I'm a uh, Eastern libertarian. On the other hand, when I meet Sri Yang or Iman or Islam, okay. instead of there, uh, we've had some lectures already in Sofia, then I'm a statist. Right? So a German educated uh, statist who, um, you know, as all statists, is not uh, consistent in what he says and uh, is a compromiser, as Ayn Rand would say. And I believe that the presentation we could be having today is. Uh, Probably the second part of what I said. Uh, I just attended the lecture before of Christian Chair, and there might be some issues that are simply completely from what you present. The topic that I put it is power, order, and the inevitability of politics. And um, I would like to talk for about, let's say, 40 minutes, and then I hope to uh, get into, into the discussion. It is meant, in a way, a civilized problem. In the very libertarian ones among you. Okay, so um, I structured off like this. Uh, the slides are very, they're not that many, and basically you'll see more pictures than text. So I'll just talk about the pictures. My first point is um, about the genesis of political and economic thought, which I think um, has to be addressed. Then I would like to talk about power, which is sort of the core of the presentation. Since I believe that power is sort of blind spot for the person, uh, a spot which um, is crucial, but which many of us and many of the classicals in the liberalism have neglected or have been seen as seriously as I believe it has been seen. Then 
don't like to say some words about order since, of course, you know that um, liberal sort of way to start seeing the market economy and democracy and society as orders, and I think this is important to add, especially if it as a direct report to power, and in the end, I'd like to talk about liberal politics, which I believe exists. Now, what the chances of um, political and economic thought? You have some power in the room, back like there, and on every now and then recommends books. Um, uh, the short book which you recommend, you recommend it sometime ago, this was last summer, is this one here, The System of Liberty, by a guy called George Smith. It's a rather thin book by Oxford University Press, and I recommend it to any of you. Since I think it has some, some interesting concepts and limits of concepts in it. And it basically says that in what's called the early modern period, um, first political thing might come back. And of course, we all know about Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, but I just briefly want to say that already back then in the 1600 something, they talked about this concept of the regular time, of course, you know, that that it might be necessary in the sense of just preventing conflict and um, violence. And of course, Locke's position as the first of the pre classical liberal that this regular time might be necessary to force the task is also to tame. Okay. We are still talking just about politics, and I will um, contest politics in a moment in a second. The economics only comes afterwards. Of course, there is the school of Salamanca, and there is, of course, interesting economic thought in the antiquity, but in the modern period, it starts somewhere in the 18th century, as we know. Uh, in Scotland, many times, but I will talk about the Scots. Not just about Adam Smith, I mean, most of us know about Adam Smith, but um, Adam Smith is just a part of this, well, it's a triangle, but of course, there were some additional people as well. And um, I think there is something interesting in seeing the Hobbes book today first and then these guys. Because these guys used what had already been worked out in the day before. And they said, okay, we need rule of law, we need constitutional provisions. And then, well, then they came up with this idea of economics as the science, as I see it, of self organization. What? Self organization within these, these constitutional provisions of the rule of law. Which means that they basically complemented the upcoming political theory by setting up this idea of self organization, or as this third guy, Adam Ferguson, called it, the spontaneous order. Okay, the spontaneous order within rules. That's what we have been debating for quite a while in some different settings that I'm also doing so here. Now, I have these two arrows, and I believe that they show quite clearly, at least in a stylized, in a stylized way, what economics and politics are about. Politics, as seen from the top time onwards, is about vertical relations between men. Um, and economics is about more or less horizontal relationships between the units. By vertical, I just mean that there is a person who dominates and a person who is dominated. And vertical and the vertical and horizontal means that basically persons who exchange have a sort of a parity in power in a way that it is a win-win the way they came, and basically none of them has a superiority over the other. But I would, what I would like to claim in this presentation is that human relationships are not just horizontal. If you like it or not, as liberals, I believe that both vertical and horizontal relationships coexist in. Um, Society, and uh, I would like to show you some reasons I see why this is the case. 
And if you bear in mind the way this science was called by John in the 17th and 18th century, as you know, it was called political economy. But the term economics, as uh, some of you might know, only came up in the, in the 1890s um, by um, coined by Alfred Marshall, who said that we well, basically we have to keep our politics and uh, make our political economy economics because it has to be a political science. But for centuries, we said the whole political economy, and I believe it was called political economy for a good reason, because the way the people I showed, and many other people, all the most economists, have thought in the concepts of political economy, which basically combines these two relationships. The relationships can, of course, have conflicts and do have conflicts, but coexist, and since they coexist, uh, we should be the problem and not think that it's always going on. Okay, I will come back to that later. Now, power. Um, as I said in the beginning, I think power is something we should think about more clearly than we do commonly as a communist, and as a communist, I'm interested in history and interested in political philosophy, but I'm a communist. But I believe that both communists and liberals, and especially liberal communists, think too seldom. We also have this idea of self regulating system, of what we call in Smith the pre stabilized power. And basically, the system is open, and the system remains open, and the open system and power is, as you know, the from Jesus, something which is at best very short run and very fast disappears. Well, I think it's not the case, or it must not be the case in any setting, and that's why I think power should be given some more attention than it's been, it's commonly done. This guy, <coughs> probably some of you or most of you know, um, this is a person who, I don't know in much detail, but it's, it's a person I've been working on over the last weeks and months. Uh, Matera is German anything. <laughs> you can say lawyer, economist, cultural scientist, historian, etc. Et uh, or basically a mastermind, this is called. And Matera had serious influences, for example, on the Mises, that you will see in a minute. Uh, he quotes Mises, and he was quotes later on many, many, many occasions. And Weber is certainly, if you look at the um, literature on power, there are many definitions in power, but the one by Weber is one which is quite dominant and persistent in also into the very recent literature. And he says that power, which is not yet coercion or authority, it's just power, power is defined by him as every chance. In a social relation, it means that it's either between two persons or gender theory. The Alcimian says that for social things to begin between three persons, because the, the relationship between two is just an interpersonal, but that's a good thing. In a social relation, power <coughs> means the, the way, the possibility to serve your own world. Opposed or even though there is opposition on the other side. Now, of course, to every libertarian, this seems a concept of oppression, uh, subordination, as we heard in Christian Chess talk about totalitarianism. But I believe that um, this power is everywhere in society, it's in any relation between humans, in any group, in any large and it can become political authority, political coercion. Political coercion is just one type of power. And that power per se is not something that that's what I would think. Um, power which is used to throw out the Nazis out of Germany was not that. It was a power which 
is for another power, and I believe in the room we have a country, we have a consensus that uh, so this would not really affect. So power itself, as I explained on the next slide, is everywhere. And power itself is not something to work there. It depends with what motives and in what ways it is important. The computer um, has coined this interesting term in German that he lets up when he the word to power. Which means, in his terms, that basically any person, in different fields of course, has this information, this, which is a pretty tradition, Everybody claims and goes for power. In any setting, as I said, they're not, they're not yet talking specifically about politics, they're talking about any social setting. And Nietzsche says, well, any of us wants to be powerful. In his family, in his group, in his class, within his fellow students, etc. Et and um, this is not in the but this is something dynamic. So basically, it's like the um, first derivative of the utility function, which is always positive. So, with any additional power is seen according to Nietzsche as something positive, seen from the one person who goes with this power. Which, of course, is dangerous. Um, it can be and has become tremendously dangerous in human history. Perfectly clear. But he says, Proposes that this is not really something unrealistic, that, that people, if you like it or not, are like that. So there will always be a supply of power in the sense that people are interested in governing or dominating other persons in social relations. So this is the supply side of this power as a money. Then there is this guy who I guess nobody really knows, I didn't know him until he's an interesting uh, German political scientist and sociologist called Andy Popitz, and he says that basically this is the supply side of power, but there is also a demand side on the power market in the sense that, again, if you like it or not, many people, not only in Bulgaria, I would say in Bulgaria, it's in the West and Western Europe, want to be from the Many people have what he says, all the security desire, which means that many people are willing to give up liberty for security or any provisions given them by somebody else. Again, if you like it or not, but I think it's an undeniable fact of modern society, especially the probably of any society, the change in modern society causes that it this is not addressed anymore only to the family, but also to the larger order as well. But if we say that these supply side of power and demand side of power are something that characterizes any society, different extent of any society, if these are seen as a put them aside as anthropological constants, so that we basically this a way people can be seen. In any setting, well, then we have this market, and this market is not to be defined away, as some liberals have done uh, in recent decades. I believe that libertarianism in particular, and this is my first provocation, libertarianism in particular, as opposed to classical liberals, is particularly blind to this power supply and power demand as a market. We say, well, we wish that people were not like that. Also, socialism wished that people are not like as they are. Um, the people are as they are. Uh, of course, they change, which would be the slightly optimistic element of talk, but um, they are as they are. And the better part of this. I would really like to say something about order and then uh, 
something like the politics and then the health uh, for both the most of it to the and the other works of expression. So let me summarize it for now. I said, well, economics, as an economic thing, and politics is very distinct from thinking quality. Complementary to other, and have done so for quite a few centuries. And then my point was that power, in the sense of I want power over other people, and how some other people want to keep me from an other person, is something I'm interpreting so everywhere, and that it can be seen as such a market phenomenon if you want to do I would like to say something about order, since I believe that this is also something quite interesting and important and directly corresponds to power. Now, order, of course, means many things. Uh, it's um, also Bulgarian, it's Quebec, uh, it's Uriadu, it's Strong, it's um, the Strong School, it's quite a difficult, uh, quite a difficult term in any language, basically, because it um, it has a quite a different history, quite a difficult history over many centuries, you might say, millennia. Uh, right? So it means different things depending on how we use it. Um, I would like to use the term here as, first of all, as something which I would have done at any time. Right? You were sitting here listening to somebody talking uh, stuff, and you're listening to what I say, and if you say that this is not completely uh, out of space, but then you might be thinking about, for example, how you some power and do it right now. And this might mean that until now you have a specific pattern in your, in your mind about power and society and human relations. And it might be that what I just said, if you haven't seen it like that before, means that you have really thought the way you have seen in the relationship. It might be. So all the way is what our head does basically constantly. I hope that these days, for all of us, also to me, as it is sitting here and we're continuing to sit in the room for it, and also tonight, because of coffee breaks and socializing, so also a way of really ordering the way young Bulgarians are uh, today. Um, I'm born maybe one, so I'm not that young anymore, but um, you can be in Bulgaria that do thing. And so that's what our mind is doing. It means that we have these patterns. These patterns change all the time in the one hand. But on the other hand, they are necessary because otherwise, of course, our mind becomes totally chaotic. And totally chaotic means that um, you are either you either get really ill in the sense that um, your mental um, recognition of the world of the world starts to do that, or you change your views of you know, every, every time. So what I say by this is that our patterns in our mind change, but on the other hand, um, we have these needs, because I think it's a case of getting into that, it's also pretty constant. We have this need of certainty when it comes to our patterns. So we are willing to be from the and we think them, but not at any point of time, and we also need this um, um, feeling of security of our patterns. People who are in church or in sect um, have specifically fixed and unchangeable patterns. I think also in many liberals, including probably myself, and that's what are certain to be sectarians and have fixed patterns. So my point is that um, we need some fixed points, as we would call them in law. We need some fixed points. In our mind, these are the values, also this can be shared something about. And these are the, as we call it, of the ontology as you see the world. So the relationships between different things happen. And then, of course, there is not just our mental order, but also societal orders. 
um, the market, politics, culture, law, all these are all, in the sense of systems, which have specific properties, the systems which we're saying that everything is linked to anything, and all the means, at least as I see it, um, that these properties are not just any property, but it has some consistency. And of course, the classic definition of order since um, probably 500 years or so is that it's the opposite of chaos. They're spectral, I know. It's kind of difficult when orders are back there, but um, we often think that order is it's difficult to define the word, and that's why you define it when you say what it is in the open okay. But I, I see your um, skepticism, and I think it's absolutely warranted because, of course, as liberals or libertarians, we say that, well, perhaps we want something that comes closer to the past. Because order has this also the semantic uh, way when you hear the word that something is static and unchanging and um, too much organized. And I think that this is not true. Again, speaking in Hayekian terms, there are orders in which are vertical in the sense of hierarchies, but there are also orders like the market which are orders, uh, which are horizontal, but are not there. Now, what I'd like to say is that this contains order, the higher which of course most of you know, and chaos are uh, deeper, and we have a consensus on that in the room. And the question is how do we lay it? Not even the deeper, not uh, so much because um, spontaneous order just establishes itself and surpasses chaos. But because spontaneous order, and uh, I would like to use a picture of it, makes specific things to be not chaotic but to become an order. There is this picture in the highway of the crystal. So, first you have a liquid, and then you want in this liquid a uh, crystal to emerge. But this crystal will not emerge under any circumstances. You need Specific temperature, you need specific pressure, you need, of course, a specific, um, specific composition of this liquid. And only then, if all these liquids exist or pre exist, only then this crystal will come up as a spontaneous order. Otherwise, you just get the open field with moving molecules. And this is also the way I um, see the difference in societal terms between chaos and spontaneous order, which means that. Um, for something not to be chaotic but spontaneously ordered, you need some things. So, what are some these things? I would say that it is nothing different in Hayekian terms than what we heard in the beginning with the law and its constitutional provisions. So, you need this self organization of human security, but within the borders of uh, the English concept of the real world, or what the Germans call the uh, tech chart, which is something slightly different, but basically the same. So we need general rules, or general general um, general is a, it's a, it's a Kantian word that we can get it pronounced in German. Um, so rules which are valid for everybody, um, rules which are extract and are concrete, and rules which are prohibitions, so prohibiting things in the um, mind. And if you have these rules, and then we as liberals, at any generation, I believe, have to think about what kind of rules we need in our specific time, also with our specific technologies which we have, which 30 years ago did not exist, perhaps we need less rules or more rules uh, than before. But only if these rules pre exist. And then the market is not fair. So the market is not spontaneously ordered in that The market is spontaneously ordered according to these guys in the slide only if these rules exist. 
Now, we heard in the presentation before me that morality is there in any of us, and that's why we don't need legislation. Well, I don't agree on that for two reasons. First of all, and there was a smart question, what is morality and is your morality the same as mine? I think um, it's a very appropriate question because uh, even in a specifically homogeneous group, that we sit in the room, our morality is real people, I'm quite sure. And second, there are moralities, but that's not in the where power, and that's what we had before, is very strong. So we are not angels sitting in the room, but there are people in the room, certainly, who like being in power, as an example. So at least in that respect, we differ. And if we differ, and if morality differs in such a very crucial point like the work of power, uh, then the, what we heard before, that everything self organizes on the basis of morality, is not quite true because we could have diverting or flashing moralities, which would mean that um, it is not self organized and we need legislation. Uh, so the specific moralities of the ones who love power or perhaps even aggression are prohibited. Because otherwise their morality would hurt mine. And I don't think that morality is something natural which is uniquely without with any of us in the same uh, in the same way. We differ. Even in this room, let alone in a society of seven million like Bulgaria or eight million Germans or uh, seven million people living on the world. We do differ. Okay. So that so much about order, spontaneity is something which Needs conditions and only then comes up and fixed points in the minds of all of us, which are necessary because otherwise we are not possible to cognitively see the world. Having said all that, I would like to come to my last point, which is liberal politics. Because there are many in the room who would say, well, Legal politics does not exist. But as I have put it on the slide here, it's an oxymoron. Two words which evidently contradict each other. Mind I respect in a way this view, but it's not mine. <coughs> and I will try to show you what I believe that liberal politics is not only not an oxymoron, but it's actually what we're doing today. And what um, probably what is I hope any of us will continue doing after this day. What happens, um, guys, probably you know both of them, but this rock part. And my question is addressing you, because probably quite a few of you uh, use um, this is the board as a source of information, so do I. Um, my question is, uh, if we see these guys, <laughs> I will never forget our wonderful discussion um, on the Facebook group of the Libertarian Post Society. No, no, it's not. It's, the group is not for We had a discussion, yeah. but we had a discussion with a uh, guy with my peer, so we can check it out. So months ago, who claimed that Apple, as you can over there, is the smartest, not better, the most clear and structured thinker, you know, not just of the millions, but ever. So we've seen quite a few deaf people um, in this presentation until now, and the claim was that the German authorities who arrived with the nutrition now is smarter than any of the ones you saw from what we now come to today. Well, I'm as uh, crazy today as to contradict this uniquely smart person because I believe that at least um, in terms of rhetoric, what Rothbard and Hoffer are saying about the state and about democracy 
is the only way to go from C. We were talking about the sheep in the break, the sheep are here, right? Um, so um, this our enemy state uh, as a claim of the of work part, or democracy as organized step for the sheep. Um, but often, is this the way we have to see democracy or democratic state? Well, might be, but I don't think so. And it's not just me who doesn't think so, which not just me who doesn't think so, but also this guy doesn't think so. So the Mises go forward, signs, and it's very, very, very probably the crucial point of any of the technological which is if the Jews in state and the democracy is in order of the state, if it is um, something desirable or not, there is a harsh contradiction of our own the state and democracy is cheap. To guide the procedure as possible. Um, and I think this is quite important. I don't say that because I love Mises, but I think it's, I say that because it has put some interesting thoughts about why democracy and why the state uh, in its democratic form is important. I would like to present the key quotes. They are lengthy, but I have highlighted what I think is important in the this is quote number one from Human Action Chapter 18. An artistic society would be exposed to the mercy of every individual. Society cannot exist if the majority is not ready to do that by the application or threat of violent action, minorities from destroying the social order, the power is vested in the state of the world. Okay. So, I believe that this is a contradiction to what we heard before, that the state <coughs> has to be done away with. But this says no, actually. Uh, we have different people in society, and specific people in society can be conveyed dangerously if we don't have the state. And the majority, as you say, as you know, this is for the anonymous party and absolutely pronounced democrat. Then we can get into trouble. The societal order can get into trouble. In a way, as I said, in the majority means it was a rebellion. So the monopoly power is seen by is seen by him not just as nice to have, but something absolutely crucial for a society to become and stay free. Point number two, government is not only not an evil, but the most necessary political institution, blah 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 blah. blah. Um, um, and since we have the impulse to violence, so this uh, power um, in the sense of um, using power to physically um, threaten other persons, since we have that, so since we are not in non aggression principle governed individuals, we might be governed by the non aggression principle every now and then. <clears throat> and perhaps some of us are governed by the non-aggression principles at any time, but quite a few of us are not, both within the country and outside the country, in particular. Um, since we are not governed by this principle on a universal scale, the world would be different if we were, but we are not. <clears throat> That's why we need government, in the sense that a legal government is necessary for such a, an order as we use in the to, to exist. And the last quote, anarchism misunderstands the new nature of men, the rest we can um, leave one or I'm putting. This is basically what I was trying to say with these anthropological issues that people go for power and people want many go for power and many want to be dominated by the power of others. And since, I think it's somewhere here, since the world is nothing, it's either this point or in the world before, uh, that it's not a world of angels, since there are quite a few devils among us, um, then we lose. Of course, I know the arguments that we can self-organize for we can self-organize for courts, 
um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for some reasons, and we can debate that, um, we just believe that this is not the um, important, and it goes for this kind of other components. Just to remind you that this democracy is tight, and um, <coughs> the state of our enemy commits to all the victim of the music, but that is always. That's the not really my point, just a slight footnote. Now, we the same support. So if we follow this idea that um, we have the ultimate success of this group, some of the like the guys who can have a bear play in the cell phone. Yeah. Uh, um, so if Surian succeeds, and the state is destroyed completely. No state for Ivan. So even Ivan, Ivan, even Ivan is successful and the state is ruined. Okay. Okay. What then? <laughs> would be my question. Now, if you put in spontaneous policy, if you put in these equilibrium economics, or that a general equilibrium is only a uh, construct useful to analyze this from. I don't think we can miss, as Lisa would say, real nature of the The libertarian paradise, which you might hope that comes out, is it possible that we have an outcome out of the moment? What I believe <coughs> is the consequences of um, thinking in the political economics um, and this anthropology means that there will be no state called state. But there will be what I call here a quasi state, which means that power will be there, many say or not, and this power, even if it's private in the terms of having no state, because you want to be consistently successful, means that. This must not be a paradise in the reporting terms. This can actually be a society which is very popular in the 90s, where we had a state, um, which is actually just a fake, uh, our technical, another fake, but not the same fake as in the 90s. The world, of course, you had power structures which were hyper strong and persistent in today, um, without being really state. But I don't think that we can see such a world as a free world, as a free system where people in a disequilibrium world, because the markets are disequilibrium, also the market for security will be disequilibrium market. So there might be a problem in this piece or sick at some point, but then they start shooting at each other, and then um, you find a new equilibrium, and then somebody pushes the new equilibrium. So we have violent society. Says that there will be a equilibrium, stable equilibrium. Um, and you have coercion and closed markets without the state. Because these people just said, you know, all of you remember elected and not elected. The market was extremely closed, both to people within the country and let alone foreign investors, not by the state. But by the movie, and movie are um, well uh, powerful people and well organized networks, which very much exist in this uh, not real state dominated world. So even if the program of the board of abolishing the state is successful, I don't think that the world afterwards will be power free. For free of dominance, free of violence, free of coercion. I don't think this is realistic. And um, if you think of this paradisical state of having a gorgeous system, mm -hmm. I hope that you might be skeptical about its paradisical libertarian properties. I think it might become wonderful, <coughs> but I think it's going to become wonderful. It requires that we become more and more dangerous and the people don't go there against the most dangerous. <laughs> okay. 
And in such a way of a small um, quality where any of us, because all of us like to talk and convince and persuade people, then you matter. Then you really matter all the way <coughs> this small quality works. It should be that in a direct democracy, should have strong elements of direct democracy, because otherwise the parliament people can do whatever they wish. In this way, they can get a referendum if they do talk too much crap. And plus, but not least, I believe the flat tax that they get in Bulgaria is too short because we can get a flat tax and with some proposition of public debt, additional costs for everybody, and so are less developed, less, uh, are less um, probable to. Um, to um, being conducted. So these were basically how I imagine liberal politics should be. It is Sisyk, as we call it, with the area, but that's it, because people are like that, and abortion is just nothing. We all the time have to fight for these things, and there will always be people who don't like that, but um, it's a little bit more complicated than it is to say. And having democracy, the liberals don't get, take care of the status, but the wise guys said to one new, like recently, they pass the state to the others and then the others will take care of the liberals. And this is my last slide. Um, Einstein has said many smart things, but um, this I think is one of the smartest. Um, less weeks, when we talk about liberty, Orders, capitalism, anarchy, let's, things, let's make things as simple as possible. That's the way uh, we should communicate, but not simple. And specific concepts which circulate in the libertarian sphere are, in my view, simple than what they should be. Thank you. Okay, uh, Stan was smart enough to leave uh, only five minutes for questions. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're going to have that seven minutes. Not that. Thank you. So, I've got from 1990 to 2005. I've got it on two, which are more important. I think that I was. So, first, this is who is the opposition of power, very diametrically opposite to the name of the first one. And the first one is the position of power is a person who will over somebody in the world. And the second point is go, well, you see some people they act and dominate it, and some other people act and dominate, so that power. So, what everybody do that for the last second? And the second thing was your argument that uh, actually everybody can be a urge to gain more power and that more power is always better. And I think everybody would agree that we, um, if they are only in place, uh, that would give them more power. And let's say there is no state, no restriction. I will actually uh, want to try to make this place. Uh, anybody in the audience only look for that matter? I, I highly doubt that anybody will agree with that, including their comments. We need to So I think all questions are great on based on this misunderstanding of the first The first question was how power means to the you can get um, somebody can assert his will against somebody else. And my point was there are people who would like to assert their will for the most of us. But these are the people who want to have power. And there are other people who, on specific issues like politics, don't want to have power but to be them. Thousands of societal countries do. Perhaps you want to be a powerful father. You and me are actually 
interesting way of metaphysical discussion because we don't know um, how the world would function where there would be no more people and how people grow in a particular world. It's not just a physical, it's also a philosophical historical. You can see it in hypothesis, you can always have it. And the monopolization of power in a way to this theory, and the violence and sense of force, and to this unconscious reason, and it's a bit very easy. Yeah, because I had it over the last two or three years. Depending on the time. No, it's a matter of quality because if you combine towards anything which is coming out of the second different force heavy than the second. This is something fairly easy. So somewhere in the seventeen hundreds or back in England or something earlier. So previously we had societies where violence was not any normal kind and this may be it was a source of that. No, it's not a monopoly because you could know, migrate all over and you could put it in terms of my. And these people were not categorically different from the ones today. Uh, from the ones today. There were people going for power, and there were people that wanted to be there. Unfortunately, as I said for the, for the last time, but I don't think that um, this depends on our current state of affairs. Okay, final question. Yeah. Is there not a difference in individual power and government power and the different threat levels between the two? In free society, the individual wants to grow his power, he can provide goods and services, and in turn, risk war. He can also steal from people, but in a free society, there are repercussions too. He can defend himself from free society uh, and state it on free society. If the government wants to grow its power, it's got to lose the military, it needs to confiscate property, people, resources, it can take whatever it wants. And it's also based on the, the threat of uh, an enemy abroad. If in the name of security, it can kill people. It can kill them, it can confiscate whatever it wants. So is there not a difference in the type of power and the level of threat? I see a I see that the whole government has tanks and probably the government has tanks. Um, and even if Berlin gets its uh, liberty of weapons, uh, um, it probably won't still have a tank. Right? Um, so um, then violence will be slightly more dispersed uh, than it is But if I, I don't feel if you feel that a private person will kill by a tank. Um, make so much of difference apart from the state in which it ended up afterwards. Uh, so I see a difference in the state in the sense that government, of course, uh, is uh, quite, quite concentrated in its power, but I don't see that growth of difference in the three competitive powers we have at the end of the day. So if you're shot by corrupt government police or by PCC, that kind of market groups. I don't see a quality difference. Just depends on the moment. It's the power of the Yes, of the economy. It's only the leader. Okay, I think that's everyone we have. I'll see you in 20 minutes.